This is a, a, a little different to the normal setup because we don't have a chair. So I'm going to deputise as a chair and then sack myself and become part of the uh, panel discussion. <laughs> Our topic this morning is the tyranny of affluence and uh, with Geoffrey Blaney in conversation with myself. Um, a fairly, a fairly uh, spiky topic because uh, Geoffrey, of course, and we will do without the uh, mobile phones because I just turned mine off. Thank you. Um, quite an interesting place in Australian history we are at the moment. Uh, and uh, I'll give you just a bit of a run through while uh, the last of the uh, arrivals arrives. Interesting way to look at Australia is to, uh, is, to, is to have a think about where we were about 30 or 40 years ago when the rest of the world was going mad in, quite the, in pretty much the same way they're going mad today with the GFC. In the early 70s we had quite a big uh, uh, episode of sort of social stress with uh, inflation and high unemployment and our political system went nuts, our uh, bureaucracy went nuts, our judiciary even went nuts. And uh, the story that we told ourselves in the 70s was one of chaos. Of course when we look around the world at the time, in the US with Watergate, uh, you know, the three day working week and the British disease in the UK, Europe at a state of near, um, near civil war in some societies. There was dictatorships in most of the countries that are today threatening to bring down the global economy. You wind forward about 30, 35 years later and Australia is in quite an unusual position. Global financial crisis, to my mind, is not dissimilar to the uh, stagflation episode of the 70s. We had, in those days, Western societies paying themselves too much in terms of high wages and government spending. In the 21st century, you know, we've all paid ourselves a little too much in terms of the uh, government debts governments are carrying and the household debts the household sector is carrying. But the Australian story, and I think I'm going to prompt Geoffrey on this in a second, the Australian story is a lot different to what it was in the 70s. We've shown a, a resilience, I think, that's probably surprised a few people. Uh, and when I sort of look around Canberra, not only is the resilience surprised people, um, there's this sort of... Um, sort of pushback from the community, well, no, we haven't done anything, actually. What are you going to do for me uh, at the moment? We've seen a bit of that in our politics in the last couple of years. But I put that thought to one side and consider how we got here and where we're going. And as I say, the topic is quite spiky, the tyranny of affluence. And I'll introduce Geoffrey and then give you a quick one-word summary on myself for those of you who don't know me. Geoffrey, of course, is Australia's probably the most significant and popular historian. And he... He's got chairs in economic history and in plain history at the University of Melbourne for 21 years. 36 books. Is it 36 by now? We count about 36 books, including the best-selling A Short History of the World. He was a delegate to the 1998 Constitutional Convention and chaired various Commonwealth government bodies, including the Australia Council, the Literature Board, the Australia-China Council and the National Council for the Centenary of Federation. As I say, the title is The Tyranny of Affluence, Jeffrey's masterwork in the 60s was on the tyranny of distance. I'm about to sack myself as chair and move on as, uh, as co-panellist. Of course, I'm the author of The Longest Decade and Fault Lines and the quarterly essay number 40 and the book out now is called The Australian Moment, which uh, does try uh, to do a, a broad sweep of our modern history from about 1969 to 2009. Now, I sack myself as chair, I'm now co-panellist, but Geoffrey, I'll prompt you in the first instance because the topic does ask us, read the tyranny of affluence, whether we've uh, probably slipped the, dis the locational disadvantage of distance because we are now probably in the right place at the right time. We don't want to be anywhere else or anyone else, I think, in Asia. Uh, do you think we've moved from a position of uh, sort of mortal threat as a society to having a little too much? Yeah. Uh, thanks for the uh, generous introduction, George. Can everyone hear? Thank you. We belong to uh, different generations. George uh, tells me this morning that uh, he was age one when I finished the tyranny of distance. <laughs> I couldn't walk then. <laughs> and, and now he's the leading way. commentator on the last <laughs> 40 years. Uh, yes, uh, when I wrote the Tyranny of Distance, uh, it originally was in two parts. Well, it still is. The first part I called uh, The Tyranny of Distance, and the second part was called The Taming of Distance. And when the book was with the publisher, Macmillan, they said, uh, The Tyranny of Distance really would make the title. 
And uh, to me, the, word, the phrase is too abstract. I like concrete titles, but uh, they said, no, that's really the title. Hmm. So that became the title of the book, and Distance and Destiny, which is rather an odd phrase, became the first part of the book. So uh, I'm proud of the title now, and uh, I never tell anybody except you that how it came about. How it came about. <laughs> it still hangs in the memory a bit like Donald Horne's Lucky Country. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, it's, it's quite true that uh, Australia, for the first 150 or more of its uh, European existence uh, was tied uh, socially, com culturally, in economics and politics uh, in the source of its people to a most distant part of the world. And I said that's uh, one of the salient facts in trying to interpret Australian history. But of course, uh, even when I was writing the book, uh, there was this profound shift, and I think it was probably about 1966, was it, George, that Britain ceased to be our main customer and Japan passed it. That was the year. Yeah. In fact, that's quite an interesting uh, for those of you who uh, are pleased I didn't bring a PowerPoint with me. That was the year when Japan became our number one trading yeah. partner and then uh, very quickly the Americans uh, yeah. pushed the Brits into third place. Yeah. So since then there's been a profound change which you've mentioned in uh, your writings that uh, when our once again a great mineral producer our main markets are in uh, Southeast and East Asia, and uh, one of our greatest mineral areas, Western Australia. So suddenly, our our main export area is very close to our main export market, which mm. is an astonishing change. And of course, uh, there's been a great change in uh, migration and in some of the sources of our culture. So that Australia has been turned around, as you say, and the tyranny of existence works in quite a different way. Yeah, and I think the, uh, the tyranny may apply to the Americans and certainly the Europeans. They're a long way now from the, from the action where previously, of course, we wished we were over there and uh, were sort of waiting for things to come on down from London or from the continent, even with the people flows after the Second World War. Is it, is it possible that a society like ours is big enough to not to need to worry about what the rest of the world does or are we still a little too exposed? Well, everybody says it's a global economy and uh, even though a large part of our economy serves itself, mm. a huge part of our economy mm. serves itself, uh, we're still dependent uh, for our ultimate solvency and having competitive export industries and uh, even though mining is a tiny employer and its contribution to GDP is not huge, is it? No. Uh, you know, we're, in a, we're in a very fortunate position because we have this, this powerful industry. We're close to the best in the world in running it. Uh, people say Australia is just a quarry, what a pity, but uh, you know, mining is really a very sophisticated industry, much more computerised than most parts of Canberra. Hmm. And uh, <laughs> we, we should be proud that uh, in this industry, which is really high tech, uh, we're close to the best in the world. Indeed, one of the problems for Australia is so much of our talent is now going overseas to develop new mining fields, isn't hmm. it? Hmm. But, and this but, is, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Looking at the 60s, and uh, I'm, most people, especially amateur historians like myself, always look for echoes in the past because there's a, there's a point at which the generational memory runs out and then a country starts repeating a pattern that it wasn't aware of or it repeats a mistake that it had, had unlearned. An interesting thing about the 60s, and I'd say when your book was published, uh, Japan overtook Britain as our number one trading partner. So essentially our quarry then helped to rebuild Japan after the Second World War. It's quite an interesting thing for Australia to be able to do. If, I, if you think back ten years earlier when Japan sort of got the most favoured trading nation status, for the Menzies government to be able to do something like that with the, with the prisoner of war camp still fresh in the national memory, mm. um, is that, that to me when I look back now is one of those early examples of, of Australia adapting to, uh, to a shift in the global economy. Even though we had a closed economy at the time with very high tariff walls, there were parts of our economy that were, you know, you know, ultra competitive in a global setting, but also very, very nimble. So the idea that we could get over our hang-up about the enemy in the Second World War suddenly become our, our, best, uh, our best friend in trading in the 60s. Do you see maybe a rough parallel with the way we're, um, our relationship with China is operating today? You add a few more sentences. Yeah. You want me to add a couple more? You add a couple more. Okay, I will. I will uh, well, uh, one continuity, obviously, is the fact that we're 
helping to industrialise uh, the next big thing in the global economy. And China was the next, uh, sorry, Japan was the next big thing in the global economy yeah. and was a competitor to the States mm. by the 70s. It had, it had announced itself as a competitor and was shooting for the number one prize by the 80s. It didn't get there. But our quarry, of course, was part of that transaction. With China, of course, but of course with Japan there wasn't that much of a complication in the relationship because uh, they wanted our stuff, we were happy to supply it, but they didn't make any other demands on us. No. The Chinese, I think the, the difference here is that the Chinese obviously would like us to take their side in any clash with the Americans, which is a fascinating diplomatic challenge, yeah. I think, for the future. Mm. The other thing is... Uh, our connection to China is, is, is different at a societal level because we're exchanging dirt for brains because the immigration program is bringing back a lot more Chinese. We weren't importing Japanese best citizens in the 60s and 70s. Uh, it was just a, strictly a trading relationship. We've had a people-to-people -people relationship. With China, we've got a completely different relationship. Again, again, it doesn't necessarily repeat precisely, but the fact that we are the supplier to the challenger to our best friend, America, is uh, probably the continuity I see that's the greatest continuity. Yeah. Yes, um, we, uh, we rejoice that China has become, uh, in many minerals, our main customer and uh, surging forward as our export market and... Uh, I think Australians generally rejoice in that. They might not like mining to be so prominent. No. They might not like manufacturing to be in trouble, but I think there's much more rejoicing about China becoming such a strong customer than there was about Japan mm. in the 1950s and 60s becoming a strong customer. I think that generally in Australia there's very high measure of goodwill towards China in the loose sense, but we've mm. not thought of the big problem uh, when China eventually becomes, uh, as, as presumably it will, the number one economy in the world, although strictly speaking it's, it's got a way to go to pass Europe, hasn't it? Yeah, well Europe is the single biggest entity economic entity in the world. I mean, presumably that's what the Greeks are trying to do by breaking up the EU. Mm. They don't like being number one. <laughs> <laughs> but at the moment, the European Union the European area is, uh, is bigger as an economic entity than the US and, the, yes, and, yeah. and uh, China is third. Uh, but of course, you take the constituent parts of Europe, there's really only Germany in the top five, yeah. which becomes a, a different story again. Yes, but um, but we, can't, we can't quite yet imagine uh, the implications of China becoming uh, not only number one or two economic power in the world in the next 10 or 30 years, but China becoming... Uh, not the num number one military power, but uh, a mighty military power. A mighty a superpower. A mighty military yeah. power. And uh, since we've relied uh, for so long on powerful allies, we relied on Britain, didn't we, for a hundred years, and then we've relied largely on the United States for more than half a century. The idea that we might have to make some choice <laughs> and some compromise has not yet entered many heads in our good nation. Yeah, no, it certainly hasn't. I mean, it, this is... You, don't have this conversation in Canberra when you should. Uh, the diplomatic corps has this conversation amongst themselves and they do in the embassy belt of Canberra, but uh, I would bet that there's probably only two or three federal politicians who've even given this a moment's thought, which is a bit of a shame. Uh, but the Chinese, and they keep reminding us that if you want to be a really good friend, you, know, you have to tell the Americans on our behalf that the Americans ought to you know, mm. let us have a bit more of the world. Yeah. An interesting position for us. Let's just take half a step back and think through that rapid escalation of, uh, well, you call it affluence in the 60s, uh, on the back of the mining boom and on the back of the reconstruction. Well, we didn't have to reconstruct after the Second World War, but we had a lot of, uh, a lot of men to redeploy. Yeah. And, and our economy, hiding behind the tariff, all, you know, was at 1% unemployment in 1969. Now, the Australia then uh, had a bit of a brain snap at the end of the 60s and the example I cite is Poseidon. That's quite an unusual story for those who don't remember it, but uh, we have in, in the economic history books globally one of the few genuine bubbles which uh, economists like to study because Poseidon shares were trading about 80 cents on the eve of an AFL, a VFL grand final in 1969. At the other end of that, the following week, by the time you got in October, they were at five bucks and it picked it in those dollars, by the way, and they picked at 280, I think, in early uh, February of 1970. Do you see in that particular episode some, some echo in what we're seeing today 
Australia with its elevated, uh, elevated wealth. We've got 20, 21 years of uninterrupted growth as you measure it by GDP. Uh, and yet every time I pick up the paper, people are whinging about electricity prices, people are whinging about not just the cost of living, but the cost of commuting, they're whinging about their debts, they're whinging about all sorts of things. Is there an equivalent brain snap about to happen here? Yeah. It's a difficult question, isn't it? There are many people here looking around who have some memories of uh, the 1950s and the 1960s. Looking back, it was an astonishing period because uh, in, in 1950, the typical Australian family didn't have a telephone. Hmm. A uh, typical Australian family didn't yet have a car. They uh, didn't, certainly didn't have a washing machine or a dishwashing machine. Uh, the idea of uh, them travelling anywhere, if you, know, if you lived in Melbourne, the great ambition of your life was to go to Sydney, wasn't it? Exactly, it was. Yeah. S- Sydney didn't know where to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but, uh, and, and that generation saw incredible prosperity in terms of their fears and wishes, yeah. and by 1970 Australia had been transformed. And then, as you say, the, the 1970s was a, an un- very unusual period in Australia and in the world, and uh, I, I think we've had a, whether you, you date it from 1992 or sometime, we've had a very very good run, haven't we? Yeah, we've had a, an equivalent of the 50s and 60s, yeah. but um, coming off a, a, obviously a different reconstruction with the economic reform program. Mm. Um, do you, do you sense today when you look at Australia that there, is, that there is the potential or the risk for something like the 70s repeating itself here? Bearing in mind that you know, my, my sort of broader thesis is the 70s is already repeating yeah. in Britain, it's already yeah. repeating in Europe and it's certainly repeating in the US. Yeah, every, every good run comes to an end, doesn't it? Mm. We've had a long boom and miraculously it didn't come to an end in 2008, 2009, yeah. although our fears, of course were very great and people are still very jittery, aren't they? Mm. Ask Myers, David Jones, that people are jittery. Uh, so we, we, we can't be sure. My, my feeling, George, is that uh, the world, and especially the economic world, is more difficult to predict. Mm. I could be wrong than it was 40 or 50 years ago. I mean, in, the, in, the nine, in 1950, nobody could have predicted that we'd have a long period of low unemployment. No. And uh, nobody, in, uh, nobody in 1970 predicted that inflation would jump up and all around the world but especially in Australia and do enormous mm. damage mm. to the scoreboard that we rely on to make economic decisions and then in about 1990 when things didn't look so good people it was widely predicted that we're entering a long period of high unemployment yeah yeah and yet we've had a very favorable period haven't we yeah there was a lot of there was a lot of literature around the late 80s early 90s about Australia as a failed state mm. to use the modern vernacular it wasn't the vernacular used at the time and so the concern was that uh, you know, we'd pretty much run our race. Mm. The terms of trade had been moving against us for about 40 years, which is, in the jargon, essentially what the world's prepared to pay for our stuff in return for what we have to pay to import their stuff. And so they'd been declining for a good 40 years, and we sort of hit this flat spot when we had the recession we had to have. Uh, a treasurer who actually said he did this as a favour to us. <laughs> um, and people were worried about the model having broken down and nothing, and the thing we try to replace it with, deregulation didn't work either. Uh, it's usually out of the bottom that you uh, tend to find <laughs> tend to find the most negative uh, commentary around. Yeah. But thinking about where we are now, 20 odd years later, there's a lot of negative commentary again. Is that just Australian character talking or is it... Uh... Yes, I, 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 I don't know myself uh, what, what will happen to the world in the next... Uh next 10 or the next 20 years. I don't know what will happen uh, to the Australian economy in the next 30 years, but the evidence suggests that one of the components of the Australian economy in 15 years' time will be something we've completely dismissed yes. at the moment. Which is obviously what happened in the 80s. We mm. certainly dismissed mining by the, by mm. the end of the 80s, the early 90s. Yeah. But uh, the, one of the things that's unusual about Australia now is that uh, superannuation has uh, become very much... Uh, a fact in people's heads and uh, people look at the share market or hear what the others say about the share market and I think that adds a layer of nervousness that wasn't mm. there in the 1970s and 60s when people didn't worry about the share market and people didn't expect to live so long. We're a generation that expects to live a long time. I mean, the typical Australian, um, when I entered the workforce, didn't expect to reach the age of retirement. Mm. Women would, but not men. Mm. They would die on the way. Now, of course, uh, 
for those of you who keep an eye on the so-called productivity debate, uh, now the solution is to get you to work in the year 70s, mm. uh, to do two things. One, to keep you working, and two, to defer the day when the taxpayer has to pay your pension. Mm. The, um, That's why I'm here today. <laughs> still, still singing for your supper. <laughs> is there... Is there um, let's just track a couple of the big shifts in Australia in the last 40 or so years. Is there a, is there a thing in our character that still looks up to a, to a you protector? May, you must give some of your views on what's... I will give you some in a, couple, in a couple of minutes. But is there something in our character that still looks up to somebody to look after us? Britain... America now is it the mining company as a as a as a loose construct? Is that our new protector, as opposed to our, as opposed to the markets? Because a very interesting thing happened the other year when Kevin Rudd, having walked away from the greatest moral challenge of the age, without explaining why, decided to pick a fight with the mining companies and lost his job within a month. There was something, and I've seen some of this polling that both the miners did and the political parties did. There was a sense in the community that the miners had looked after us during the GFC, which wasn't technically true. I mean, the mining part of the recovery came in the second half of 2009, but that's just economists speaking. The public are obviously always right on this. But there is, um, there is this sense now, even though we don't have a great and powerful friend, that this thing is protecting us. Uh, I'll just get you to comment on that. Who's protecting us? The mining industry as a, as a, as a concept or a construct or a great and powerful yeah. friend. Yes, that we've actually transferred from a nation state to, a, uh, to an industry as yes. a protector. There's certainly a widespread view in Western Australia and Queensland and increasingly in South Australia mm. that the mining industry is the great protector, uh, but no industry, of course, can be the great protector. No. It's astonishing what can happen to an industry. Just imagine if we sat here in 1975 and... and you were, even though you were only a teenager, you were speaking with Many me. Yep, yeah. And uh, you said to me, what about the wool industry? What will happen to Australia? <laughs> the wool industry, our number one export industry, still in 1979, what would happen if that collapsed? Which we did. would have said, yeah. I don't know what yeah. the country will do, but it's collapsed and here we are. Yeah. It's true. What would have been full of bales of wool at one time. Yeah, yeah. it's true. It, um we are a little more adaptable than we give ourselves credit. Yeah. But, this, but this idea that somebody still has to look up out Absolutely. for us. Um, is that size? Is that distance? Is that I, 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 location? I think, that's, I think that's the feeling of uh, most people in the, the, the Western world. It's the feeling of most people since perhaps about the 1950s. The welfare state has either grown or yes, yes. moved into that's new territories. Uh, not so startlingly in Australia and uh, people believe that uh, the government, some arm of the government, will will protect them, and uh, you know it may, it, may, it may be there's 10 or 15 percent of people disbelieve that, but the, the majority of us, uh, if we wake up in the middle of the night, think that somehow or other we'll be looked after, mm. and uh, that's a good thing as long as you don't carry it too far. But ultimately, uh, to me, one of the sad things about Australia in the uh, and and maybe the European world in the 1980s, 1990s, is that the emphasis has moved so much. To towards rights and everyone talks about rights ultimately a democratic society uh, a vigorous economy depends on a section of the public accepting including us accepting responsibilities that's true that's true and uh, we move from emphasis on rights to responsibilities i think you can go too far in expecting to be looked after yeah so it's a, it's a, it becomes a cultural thing that uh, you, know, you know we've had a couple of generations raised on this idea that the state looks after it even though we run essentially mixed but mostly market based economies and the sort of political uh, and uh, economic vibe is rationalism. But then in the transaction between citizen and government, these aren't rational transactions. When yeah. a citizen that's gainfully employed says, where's mine mm. <laughs> from the government? <laughs> which obviously wasn't the story, which wasn't the story in the first half of the last century. I agree. I mean, a social safety net was essentially just there for the, for the poorest of the poor. Yeah. Now the, um, now, the idea of, uh, of a protector, do you think there will ever come a point where Australia has the national confidence to know it doesn't need one, that its history, once it becomes a little more familiar with its history, is one of continued uh, triumph over self-deprecation and uh, a willingness to see the glass half empty? 
because our story is still quite a, quite a dramatic and quite an inspirational story, I think, mm. uh, especially the last few years, uh, the Americans finally take note of us. And I know at the officials level, by the way, the uh, Treasury Secretary and, and, and the like in Australia and the Reserve Bank Governor would, uh, they get a lot of backslapping now at international forums, keep asking, how did you do it? But of course, they come back to Australia and wonder what went wrong here because everybody says, you know, it's terrible, isn't it? Now, by the way, Kevin Rudd did make a point uh, at the end of last year when he was reapplying for his job. He did an interview. He, he did the last interview for my book when he was re technically reapplying for his job because he asked, when are you publishing? I said, late February. He goes, aha, I'll give you this interview. Um, <laughs> why? The question, the question for me to him was, why, having got through the GFC, you know, it collapsed afterwards? He said, I just needed a few more months for enough Australians to go overseas to see what the rest of the world actually looked like and for the messages to come back of the chaos overseas. And he thought at that point people might understand it. Now the, now the economic officials now say to themselves that when we hit the road as tourists, that if the finance minister of Greece or the finance minister of Germany or the finance minister of France greets us at the airport and thanks us for our stimulus, finally, as tourists, finally the penny might drop. <laughs> quite globally aware citizens we are as Australians, but we still underestimate the trouble that's going on around the world. Um, what is that about? This, I think this comes back to this idea that maybe we've had such a good run that we probably underestimate, A, how good it is, and B, what the danger is of complacency. Would you agree yeah. with that? Yeah. I'm inclined to think, George, that uh, the global financial crisis uh, was so unexpected in so many quarters... Uh, that there's still an air of unreality bewilderment yeah. and, and unreality around. Uh, after all, it's uh, you know, the 90, early 1930s was the last serious depression in the world, and while it's absurd to compare mm. this depression, if that's the word, with the 1930s depression, there's no comparison in no. terms of hardship. This is a this is a profound shock, and it's uh, it, it's interesting that uh, that we could have been uh, seduced, especially by economists, into thinking that we had entered a permanent era in which a major financial collapse was no longer happened. Yeah. And uh, it's a shock of such magnitude that uh, we're still playing with it. And it was interesting, wasn't it, that after the first collapse, the stock market recovered very quickly and people said, well, it looks as though it's over. Yeah. And uh, here it is, uh, nearly four years, isn't it, after the first banging on the wall? Yeah. And uh, we're still not sure where things will go and in some ways that was the, the characteristic of the 1930s there was a remarkable recovery you know, between let's say 1932 and 1936 in most parts of the western world and then mm. there was a, yeah. another downturn wasn't there which there wasn't was, really was. out of the way when the, first, the second world war began yeah. and in fact the phrase recession almost was coined for, for popular use and for uh, academic use to contrast downturns, subsequent downturns, to the depression. Mm. Now, of course, the GFC is not the depression, but it is a deep recession. So maybe what we might need to do is to reinvent a term in between recession and depression to be able to give people the idea of the gravity of this episode yeah. versus all previous downturns, because they, you could call them downturns or periods of stagnation. Mm. Um, this is a deep recession. I mean, our unemployment rate is less than 5%. Our unemployment rate is half what it was at our last recession, yeah. whilst unemployment has doubled or trebled, depending on the jurisdiction overseas, since their last recession. So um, there are... Um, yeah, we really... Uh, you're, you're saying we really need uh, a new scoreboard for major economic activities, the idea that we call a recession uh, when is the two successive quarters, yeah, no half one, a year of... Yeah, well, no one actually ever explained to me this, this definition, by the way, which is the, they call it the technical definition of recession, uh, an economy that goes backwards two quarters in a row. Well, of course, the economy did not go backwards in 1975 for two quarters in a row, but the quarter in which it collapsed and brought down the Whitlam government with it, yeah. um, you know, the growth either side of that was never going to make up for the, for the loss in that single quarter. But we have these silly technical decisions, uh, uh, definitions. Paul Keating, in fact, encouraged it because he thought he couldn't have one. And then he had one and he said, I meant it. But of course, that was, by the way, by the way it was the two-quarter definition which, which drove Kevin Rudd 
and the gang of uh, Kevin Rudd and the ga- as a member of the gang of four, uh, Gillard, Swan, and Tanner, and also the Reserve Bank and the Treasury. There was this, whatever reason, whether it's a rational decision or not, the community thought a recession equal two quarters, so they pumped the cash into that uh, a particular quarter to hold GDP up mm. for long enough to be able to say we avoided a recession. Code, we avoided a deep recession. By most definitions, it's a downturn. And uh, then we have this other debate now about whether it was real, mm. um, which is a debate only we could have, by the way, because no other country is having a debate about whether this entire episode is real. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be sent to jail. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for even, for the other, is, isn't uh, this one of the problems of uh, the way we measure recession? And recession is quite a forbidding word if you see it on the headline. That if a country is growing rapidly, let's say its population advancing at 2% a yeah. year, and you're comparing yourself with a country who is actually a declining population, why should you use no, exactly, that? Exactly it's well absurd, put. isn't it? Yeah, it is absurd. It is absurd. And the other, the other problem about measurement, and measurement really really is important in economic activity and our perceptions of our world. The idea that, uh, and, and this is right, isn't it, that uh, you're, you're not unemployed if you work more than two hours? Well, this is one. the standard international definition. If you've worked an hour um, in, the, in the survey period, you, uh, you're not counted as unemployed. If you're working one hour a yeah. week? Yeah. 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 Well, I think it's one hour a fortnight, but uh, please don't quote me. Any economists in the room? Now, the, one of the interesting things... So this, in is one of, this, is, this surely is one of the failures of uh, the economics profession. Economics is really one of the most advanced of the social sciences. It really is. By the, it's humble competitors yeah. advanced. And the fact that uh, such important questions of definition are hanging in the air, yeah. world important questions of definition, you know, we wouldn't uh, dream of doing, allowing that to happen when our temperature was being taken at the doctors yeah. each week. No, it's true, it's true. And one of the things, without getting too technical on you, but the, one of the things with the definitions that people seek, they also seek, and this is a thing in the contemporary culture, they also seek instant affirmation, a yes or a no, uh, on something that takes, or takes historians potentially many decades to be able to see a, to pattern or to be able to understand the past, uh, economists never pretend to understand the present or predict the future. They're actually very good at interpreting the past themselves, but they'll never admit this to you. A historian begins, because you're talking about history, begins with, the, uh, with, uh, with that as a, not a capacity constraint, it's actually what you do for a living. Yeah. Whereas we, in the economics profession, want you to think, A, we know what's going on right this minute, and B, if you push me hard enough, I'll be able to predict the next 30 years for you, which I think is a mug's game. <laughs> Now, let's talk about some of the big changes in Australia. Hey, just one thing. Yeah. What, what do you think is going to happen in the next... <laughs> Good question. We're, Good question. We're talking statements of probability. We're not making predictions. What, what's your feeling? Uh, I, th- I think we actually have to test... I think the society has to test mediocrity again before it pushes through to whatever its next creative, adaptive, resilient manifestation of self is. So I think Australia's, Australia's almost talking itself down to the point where it must go through with the thing, whatever it is, whatever form of mediocrity we're uh, testing at the moment, and it starts in politics because the absence of leadership is one of the things that makes people feel quite gloomy at the moment, notwithstanding their, um, you know, they've been saving the last five years in a way that they haven't saved since the 60s, and their debts are uh, looking pretty good. They're sitting on a lot of cash. Uh, the rest of the world wishes they were here. Americans want to migrate to Australia for the first time in their hi- history. Um, we'll be getting a lot of Greeks again, a lot of Spanish again. We'll be getting a lot of Italians again, a lot of Irish, a lot of Brits. Um, but no one wants to own our success. So if a country keeps talking itself down, there'll come a point where we validate that, um, that prophecy. And I think at that point we might snap out of it because there might be, a, uh, I don't know how long it would take, but there might be recognition that this is kind of not us. Because mm. the, the, the longer continuity I see, as I mentioned, is quite a resilient and adaptive place. Um, we still might be a little too small for most people to notice us out yeah. there, but we, 
always surprise ourselves on the upside, but I think yeah. we have to test a bit of mediocrity in the next little while. Mm. The other thing is, and I can make a very, very simple political prediction, so you know, let's push the econ economics to one side, because I still don't understand things like foreign currency markets. I do not understand the foreign currency market. I can tell you as an economist, most people uh, uh, will tell you that there's going to be a prediction in the budget about where the dollar's going to sit. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even dare hazard a guess on things like that. But we have to, as part of the mechanics of putting together a budget. But in the political sphere, and this is why the 70s, this is why the 70s echoes for me, maybe it's because I've spent so much time uh, looking back on my childhood through an adult size in preparation for my book. But one of the things that happened in the 70s, pretty much every government that was standing before the first oil shock was gone at the next election. So Nixon to Ford to Carter and the US presidency, which most people remember, there was a, a one-term Conservative government, Edwards Heath's government, fell at an early election. There were two elections that year. The first election was inclusive. Hung parliament anyone? The Brits had a hung parliament in 1974 and again uh, last year. Uh, even Canada, where uh, Trudeau was pretty popular, yeah, even yeah. he got done in the end. Uh, here, of course, we went from uh, Whitlam to Fraser and then back to hawk pretty quickly by our standards to be flipping governments every, every couple was, of terms. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that volatility, we're seeing it, and we're seeing it in a more dramatic way now, um, in the Greeks, and I'll give you a couple of uh, uh, points from the, from the Greek elections just the other week. Their two main parties, which have shared, you know, swapped government between them since they became a democracy this most recent period, since 1974, Pashok and New Democracy, a bit to the left of Labor is Pesok and a bit to the right is New Democracy of the Liberal Party. Their combined primary vote in t at the 2009 Greek general election, and that's a couple of years after the GFC, was still around the 80% mark, which is the benchmark for Australia in 2010 when we hung out Parliament. So the two main parties between them combined got 80%, which left the last 20 as minor parties, you know, rabble rousers and the indifferent. Mm -hmm. now, most democracies, if they can get a primary vote of 80% between their two main parties, you would call them pretty stable democracies. That election the other week, the two main parties were down to 32%, so they've gone from just under 80% to 32%, so they've got 68% voting none of the above, and that's happened in the space in their system in just three years. So that's at the extreme end of the volatility. But at the not-so-extreme end and the familiar end of the volatility is the government that got us through the GFC gave up its majority within a term, which hasn't happened before in Australian history outside of the Great Depression, of course, when the Scullin government went under. In the US, of course, Barack Obama, with a vote in composition not dissimilar to the vote Kevin Rudd got in 2007, Barack Obama got a 53% uh, rounded uh, at the presidential election with the same roughly the same demographic composition, notwithstanding the fact that Australia's makeup is different to the, to the US's. You know, at their midterm elections, the Republicans took the House back and almost took the Senate. So the swing, the swing, essentially every time somebody turns up to a ballot box, they're not thinking left or right. They're not thinking, you know, my values versus their values. They're just thinking, who's in charge and how quickly can I punish them? Mm. And, you know, in Victoria, by the way, we could be looking at a one-term Liberal government. Ted Bailey may possibly lose the next state election, which will come as a shock to people writing the Conservative uh, script, thinking that it's, you know, we're going to be a sea of blue after the next federal election. That volatility, by the way, repeated itself in Australia straight after Whitlam lost the 75 election in a landslide. Neville Rand gets up here the next year. So if you're looking for a prediction, I think this sort of unsettled political period is part of the global vibe. OK, we got out of the first GFC. If there's a double dip, we may not survive the second one. But no leader in Australia today can explain the world back to you. I mean, I'm, I know I can't. But they're in a job where they have to pretend they can. And they can't explain the world back to you, which is why I think we'll be flipping, we'll be flipping governments every other term. So that's, um, that's political prediction. The economic prediction is uh, you wouldn't want to be anywhere else but here. Uh, as I say, we've got locational advantage now, and if, if the longer story of this century is that Asia's rising, um, well, we are a Western nation in Asia, but we're essentially part of that story. We're not part of Europe's decline, we're not part of Britain's decline, and we're certainly not part yeah. of America's crack-up. Mm -hmm. I, I agree in this sense that uh, 
if you look around the world, uh, we have to see ourselves as in a fortunate part of the world. Mm. Not impregnable, of course, no. we're not impregnable, but uh, that, that to me is one of the strange things about uh, sections of public opinion in the last three years. Uh, people say uh, it's, it's terrible, we've got uh, a two-speed economy, you know, a two-speed economy is infinitely better than a no-speed no economy. Speed economy. Oh, but more to the point, two speeds means there is one of the speeds is actually global's best practice. You know, it's a hard thing for us. In one respect, public opinion accepts mining companies look after us. In another respect, we don't want to say, hang on a minute, we're number, that means we're number one. Because mm. you can't tell yourself in Australia that you're number one, you know, apart from you know, that ice skating race at the Winter Olympics a couple of years ago when <laughs> everybody else fell over and the guy <laughs> called Stephen Bradbury... I'm still here, I've won a gold medal. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we only need to uh, know a little bit about our own history. One of the great events uh, in Australian history was the gold rushes of the 1850s. Mm. It transformed this country, the population trebled. In the space of 10 years, Australia became one of the wealthiest countries in the world. We had speedy economy here and this a slumped economy there around the country. Our history should tell us when we have good luck and when we don't. Yeah. And uh, it's strange, isn't it, that here we know a lot about our history, but we don't realise that we've been through a fortunate period in the last three or four years. You, you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I think um, it, it's interesting you mentioned the gold rush, of course, because we'll take you back to uh, we'll take it back to mining before we throw open questions from the floor. Um, one of the things that you know you, we're sort of taught as kids. The gold, from the gold rush, we built Melbourne. Essentially, marvellous Melbourne came. So that was not a bad. That was not a bad way to catch the super profit from this resource. <laughs> Big question, but you can answer it in long form or short form. Uh, this particular phase of this particular mining boom, we are in a super cycle. Theoretically, this thing could run for another 10 or 20 years. There might be some big peaks and troughs in between, but the trend line is that way. Uh, China is, you know, by a factor of five bigger than the, the Japanese story for us as an economy in the 60s. Um, are we in a position to use, uh, can we think our way through the thing to be able to do something of the equivalent scale that we did after the gold rush to a country like this? And what would it look like if you could do it? You're talking in some way of... Uh, catching the thing. Yes, catching. Catching the thing and reinvesting it. Yeah, yes. yes. The, the, uh, if, if you regard the building of Melbourne, the first uh, skyscrapers in Melbourne and all the railways and the explosion of Melbourne's population as uh, one of the fruits of the gold rush, it was, a, it was a fruit that you had to spit out part of, didn't you? Yeah. Because it was extreme, it was, it was, yeah, it was and extravagant. Had, and we had a depression yeah. in the 1890s. Yeah. 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 I, I think it's very hard to, uh, to, to handle well the fruits of a good time. Uh, the, the fruits of this, this good time are coming coming to us in a favourable dollar and mm. Australians are pouring overseas yeah. <laughs> instead of going to the Gold Coast and the Sunshine Coast which are craving mm. the tourists. Uh, we're really deciding much more than we realise how we're spending the fruits of this boom, aren't mm. we? And we're not spending it here. No. We're either saving it, so we're not spending it, or if we are going to spend it, mm. we're at Macy's. Yeah. 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 Just to I just add one comment about China. Uh, I think myself that Japan did as well as China has done in the period after the 15 years after the war. Mm. They started from a higher base, mm. but, but that makes it more difficult to have high percentage growth rates. Mm. And uh, Japan uh, fell into trouble in 1990 and has not recovered. Yeah. Uh, Germany uh, was the great success story of Europe uh, from 1945 to 1990. It took over... East Germany, which was like us taking over PNG, mm. and uh, it was very difficult. Germany has now almost got over that, but, but it's not. It's taken really a long time to, to absorb but, that. Yeah, yeah but, but but all countries that have powerful, it seems that all countries which have powerful periods of growth r run into trouble. We mm. we don't know why they will run into trouble, but to me, it's uh, China will run into trouble, whether it's mm. in 2021 or yeah. 2027. Yeah. The growth rate then will be down to 4.8 and people will say, whatever's yeah. the world coming to. Yeah, yeah it'll, it'll be terrible then. Mm. Um, of course, given that we have um, 
and this, is, this thing is now sort of got bipartisan consent and it's sort of no longer debated and probably means at a community level is no longer really understood. If your currency floats like it does and you get this thing, what we're going through now actually, and it doesn't feel like it, is it's, the economists call it a positive income shock. Normally Australia gets it the other way where the rest of the world marks us down. But in this particular instance through the growth of China, um, we're suffering, we are going through, not suffering, you don't suffer these things, but you go through a thing called a positive income shock. Now the dollar rises to take the heat out of the Australian economy. The dollar rises for two reasons. One, to keep inflation down, because that's what a floating currency does, but it also, um, it also transfers as much of the capital as you possibly can to yeah. WA. Now, China goes from 12 percent growth rate to eight and then to four and everybody in this room thinks that's the end of Australia. Well, imagine what it would feel like again for the other nine-tenths of the economy that's not part of the mining boom when the dollar gets back to about 75. We all breathe a little easier. The thing is, the model is actually quite adaptive. Um, it's a bit hard to communicate to people because you can't, you can't present a catastrophe and say, I can see the bright side of this catastrophe, which is the end of the China boom. Um, but I wouldn't say I'd look forward to it, but uh, I'd like to have this debate 10 years from now if China does go under. And I suspect, given that we've probably bottomed out of our you know, leadership... Yeah, not, not, you're not saying go under, but decline. Decline in, in importance, yeah. 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 Slow. Mm. In, in, the, in the Japanese sense, they hit the wall and then didn't grow for the next 20 years. In Germany's sense, they were growing and then they slowed. Um, you know, the Chinese... Uh, you know, it's not volatility that you will introduce. Basically, it's it's a form of stagnation, a growth stagnation yeah. that they'll have. Mm. Yeah, I mean, very these are very interesting questions for the future. But uh, like I say, I wouldn't. Uh, yep. We've got about ten minutes of questions, by the way. Yeah. yeah like I say, I still wouldn't want to be anywhere else if uh, if I was uh, asking the world's seven billion citizens which country's best place. That's now, we're the most optimistic pronouncement <laughs> ever heard in the shed. <laughs> <laughs> now I've got uh, so we've got because <clears throat> this thing's been recorded. Uh, so when you stand up and you get your microphone, you give me a name and a question, not a speech, <laughs> and address it to either one of us. Thank you for, the, uh, for listening intently to the, uh, to the conversational part. So I'll take the gentleman here. Mike, Michael RNC, in this big picture story, you're right to mention the word complacency. Uh, I read the paper today and we're talking about a long and painful adjustment to Europe uh, coming out of this crisis. And we heard Ken Henry say, we, you know, a curious thing, we could become a, a haven for money flowing out. Mm. But what, what I think is missing from this discussion is the prospect of the inflation from the printing, the printing presses whirling away in other parts of the world, whether that inflation is likely to come here. Large scale inflation is always, always around the corner. Uh, we, 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 the world largely conquered that mm. bout of inflation that we had in the 1970s and 1980s, the worst inflation the world had seen since probably the Napoleonic Wars hmm. and remarkably by putting the war against inflation high in priority, the world did fairly well, didn't it? It did fairly well and in fact infla extended periods of inflation are the exceptions to the rule. And uh, well, look, one of the dangers in the European setting is that people try to inflate their way out of their debts and that's... Um, and that's, that is a concern. But the transmission of European inflation to the rest of the world was a couple of things driving prices down and the technological revolution is, is pulling rank on pretty much everything and that's the China story. But you do have this other thing which is the elevated cost of energy. Now the big, the big clash between America and China was really about the price of energy as it was America's big whilst Americans were trying to get inflation out of the system in the 70s or 80s, they were also trying to suppress the price of oil after the first couple of oil shocks in 73 and 79. And the global price of oil, I think, halved in about 86, and that's when we went into our banana republic phase. So you'd worry about inflation, but you wouldn't think that that inflation was the long-term risk. The long-term risk is, is in, in the West especially, as the populations age and they're carrying these huge debts, and that, and that governments, through their spending, are crowding out the, the productive economy and also they're carrying so many citizens who are beneficiaries. I think that that's probably a bigger risk in the long run, which is stagnation, not the prices skyrocketing. Mm. Next, we'll get a question over here and then the question here. 
All right. You've been talking a lot about sort of a cultural identity that we have of um, needing an overseer and um, we're, we're really hard done by. But the government seems to keep doling out money and the media keeps portraying that how bad we offer, how badly we are off. You know, um, how do we get over it? I mean, you haven't talked about that at all. And wouldn't you, being in the media, um, be sort of pushing that point forward a bit more all the time? You know, how we just keep getting money and we're just always really badly off. Yeah, I, I imagine in the in, 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 in the next life, I, in a post-media career, that I become this sort of one-man band declaring a war on whinging. <laughs> but that... <laughs> but the difficulty with that is that I'd have to name and shame and I'd never do that to a colleague because, you know, glass houses. Because <laughs> I'm sure I've made a lot of errors in my time professionally. But the... the look... I don't know who saw Bill Kelty the other night on the ACT Congress speech. There was something, and it was interesting to hear that echo of the 80s and the early 90s, which is the trade-off, which is, OK, if you chase the dollar in the long run, it doesn't help the worker. It certainly doesn't help your living standards if you chase the dollar in the, wrong, in the long run. So if you offer a sacrifice, in those days the sacrifice had to be because our inflation was essentially sourced to excess wage payments in unproductive sectors, um, so what they, what they did in the 80s and 90s was this huge trade-off for uh, money wages for social wage and the social wage is, as you, everyone's familiar with it now, Medicare and superannuation. So the way, to get rid of, the way to get rid of the 21st century malaise, the way to stop, say, a Labor government looking at its polls and going, well, I'll just do what John Howard did in 2001, I'll, I'll do for my voter the school kids' bonus even though a few years ago we, the Labor Party, attacked the baby bonus because it was going to be spent on plasma screens. And then when Tony Abbott now attacks the school kids' bonus, we say, what? What are you doing? You know? And he says, no, but you said that a couple of years ago. When you get past that politics, when somebody works out how to, how to tell the electorate that the extra dollar I give back to you is one dollar less I invest on your behalf, um, unfortunately, something has to go wrong to prompt that, to prompt that epiphany in the political class. Um, look, I see, and I made, made this point yesterday when we were talking about the... Uh, we had a session on the mining boom. I do hear from a lot of politicians who are quite demoralised by their peers, by the Gillard Abbott crowd. And they're on both sides and there's a super majority to be rid of both of them. And that's not disrespected individuals, but they've both of them got themselves in this sort of negative feedback loop um, where they have to... Because they're, they're permanently afraid of the electorate, they have to keep shouting back at it whilst trying to appease it. Um, so there are a lot of people in the system now that would like to do it differently. So I'm hoping that, uh, you know, I suspect we'll, we'll need a crisis to, 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 to bring it out of us, but I'm hoping that it's possible to think our way through it. Sorry, the gentleman here for um, a question. We've got another five minutes, so I'm still going Sorry, well. Catherine. George, could I just ask you to expand on your hunch or prediction that we're going to test and validate mediocrity? Do, did you mean that in a policy sense, and in which case, uh, case you know, what kind of policies would represent okay. mediocrity in your opinion? Well, no, in a policy sense, we're already in the mediocre phase. I think, I think, uh, I think since John Howard uh, finally better down the GST in 2001, and we had these various hostage situations in 2001 when the motor vehicle lobby said, give me a cent back on fuel excise. Sorry, one and a half cents. I should round it up to one and a half cents. One and a half cents almost brought down a government in 2001. You know, Kim Beasley went to that 2001 election, wanted to roll back the GST off gas and electricity prices. Hello, carbon tax. Tony Abbott is just borrowing from Kim Beasley. We are in that phase now, and we've been in that phase for a few years. But the interesting thing about this phase that we're in is when a leader tries something big, like from the conservative perspective, work choices, or from Labor's perspective, the ETS, what they do, strangely, is they announce it and then run away and try and change the topic. So after John Howard introduced work choices, he was doing the citizens' test again. So he's trying to get Indians to remember Don Bradman's batting average. And, of course, they could give it to you to 18 decimal points. So that's, of course, they're going to get in. Um, <laughs> So we are, we are already there in the, way the pol in the way politics is behaving. But real mediocrity for Australia is, is to lose this capacity to invest in, in your future. Now, real mediocrity for Australia is 
is not just the rollback of the carbon tax and the mining tax. They would be metaphors for something else. If the transaction of the next coalition government is, I take things away that raise revenue while at the same time increasing the things I give you back unfunded, that is real mediocrity. And that's actually, in terms of our 80s and 90s and early noughties experience, that is actually un-Australian because that's not our, and I use that term loosely, not specifically, um, that is not how we've behaved in the last 20 or 30 years. Surplus budgeting, other things being equal, is almost uniquely an Australian thing. I mean, it's obviously a Norwegian thing and a couple of others. Canada hasn't done too badly. New Zealand in, in patches hasn't done too badly. You know, but for every one surplus the Americans have produced in the last 30 years in their federal budget, we've had roughly three or four. So if we went... if Mediocrity would be measured very, very simply in losing the willingness to tax the population whilst increasing the money you give back to them. So that's, um, that's uh, an ever-present danger. One right up the back, and I think I know Betty of Bondi. Can you grab a, Elizabeth, can you just grab a microphone? Yeah. My, professor, my question is to Professor Blaney. When you look back on the great boom in Melbourne and in Victoria that followed the gold rushes, was there more inclination than you see now from the mining companies to invest in the society, in the community itself, or was the, were the robber barons the same as ever? Yeah, what was the question? When you look back on the gold rush um, and compare it to contemporary mining practices, in the period in the gold rush there was a lot of reinvestment in Melbourne and the like. Yeah. Are, are the mining companies today prepared to give back or are, were the robber barons ever thus, I think? Yeah. yeah. Yes, the, the, in the gold rushes of the 1850s, uh, which Victoria rather than New South Wales was the hub, uh, a large proportion of the diggers had come from the British Isles expressly to dig gold, and if they failed, they went. Home. If they failed, they stayed here, where all the descendants of the failures. And if they were successful, they, they went back to Scotland or Ireland or Britain. So that um, <laughs> no matter the situation, there are the, there are people who are going to take away take away the yeah, wealth. Yeah. Of course, the ones who stayed, they invested their lives in the country and uh, where, where the gainers of their generation, because on the whole, they are an enterprising generation. Uh, one of the interesting things about the gold rushes of the 1850s and the 1860s and 70s in Eastern Australia is that uh, when big companies or medium-sized companies became the norm and people worked for wages, uh, most of the shares were owned by Australians. Mm. And uh, if you go to Ballarat, and uh, I mean Ballarat has got a better collection of public statues than Sydney and Melbourne. It has a better collection of public statues, whether of heroes from the old world or heroes from this world, and, and that's what happens when local capital... Yep. Yep. Of course, w when the mines go down, the local capital bears the losses. Hmm. Hmm. But uh, Bendigo is a wonderful-looking town because Bendigo had a stock exchange in the 1870s much larger than Sydney, and virtually all the shares in the Bendigo Stock Exchange were owned by Australians, and the dividends went to Bendigo and other parts mm. of Australia. But of course, when, the, when Bendigo went down, the losses were worn mm. by, by Australia. So it's, a, it's quite a complex situation, isn't it? Mm. OK, we, that's, that's our hour up. Of course, the uh, camera has just stopped. Now, I want to thank everybody for listening attentively. This has been a terrific audience. It's quite a big barn we're in, so it's possible that some of you might not have heard every word, but much appreciate your um, attentiveness. And also, I just want to thank Geoffrey. This has been a terrific chat, and uh, we'll see you at the next one. And good luck with your book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.